Welcome to Rates and Barrels, presented by Topps. Check out Topps Project 70, celebrating 70 years of Topps baseball cards. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris, and Britt Giroli is back. Welcome back, Britt. On this episode, we discuss tonight's Game 6 between the Astros and Braves. We ponder the question, will this series go 7? Will this show be extended by at least one extra day? Because we'll still have a recap show after the series ends, so... The question is, will there be a Thursday show? And beyond that, we're actually going to talk about the changes the Padres have made. They have a new pitching coach, Ruben Niebles. They have a new manager, Bob Melvin. Wow. Padres are like the anti-Mets. They go out and they get the A-listers. So we'll talk about that and the changes that could uh, bring in San Diego. But of course, we are here for the World Series. So we begin with a Game 6 preview. And I just saw a tweet from our colleague Jake Kaplan about Luis Garcia. This is the first time that he's not starting a game in this postseason on extra rest. He's starting it on short rest. So that is a massive adjustment. Three days rest for Garcia. What kind of impact do we think that is going to have on Garcia? And, you know, I think you've made yourself the resident Luis Garcia expert over the last two years. So I think we have to throw that question to you first. <laughs> I don't know. We saw the we saw the velo in the long rest ones was nice. And I just I think we're going to know a lot when we see the first two fastballs. You know, are they going to be 93 or are they going to be 95? And I think there's going to be a big difference between the two. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to James, too, by the way, who uh, is acknowledging your major award, the Edward Murray. Yes, you congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Um, yeah, I agree. I think I think the World Series is just going to come down to the Astros lineup now, is it not? Um, no one is expecting Garcia to go super deep into this game. Or and to so shut now the, everyone down. Right. And so essentially you have like a glorified bullpen game for Houston, right? Like if he goes three, four innings, would that surprise anybody? They might even sign up for four innings Yeah. Um, from him. So you know, it would seem like the Braves have an advantage. They actually have a starter in Max Freed. Um, but the thing about the Astros is they're pesky. Their offense is pesky. They should have lost the game five. Uh, you know, they fell into that early hole and climbed back out. And now they're in Houston. So I think it comes down to guys like Jose Altuve, Alex Bregman, who Ken Rosenthal wrote on our site about some of the stuff he's dealing with um, in his stalled World Series. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see what they do with a young arm like Garcia, how far they push him, as you mentioned, Derek, because he's in uncharted territory here. Uh, but to me, though, the bigger question tonight is what is Max Fried going to do against that Astros lineup? Because he wasn't particularly good the last time out against them. Yeah, I mean, the game plan was, was everything. We wondered if he would avoid uh, up and in to the Astros because that's an area where they do damage. And it seemed like he did at least game plan to avoid it and it still didn't make a, a huge difference so what's the other think, adjustment he can make i think it, it did two things i think it um it worked from the astros point of view <laughs> like it, it helped them because it made him more predictable you know he basically lived lower half of the zone and didn't have to make them honor upper half of the zone um and he also tried to do a lot of breaking balls in the zone and i think that was the first wrinkle you know at first he was he was doing okay you know right filling up the zone with breaking balls and then like they all started putting out their b swings that's when bregman you know uh took him to the opposite field i think if i'm remembering correctly um and uh then he also uh you know left a couple four seamers uh that he was trying to hit the bottom of the zone left them up a little bit uh that resulted in some hits but you know i was looking back at it um it was like a bunch of singles you know i don't know it yeah. wasn't really powerful contact yeah if you go back to that game game two of the series max freed had 15 swings and misses and on top of that the f uh, four of the five hardest hit balls were on the atlanta side so yeah you know results maybe not what you wanted but underlying numbers not awful I do wonder what you do as a coaching staff and as a pitcher when you execute a game plan, you keep the contact soft, you get a lot of whiffs, but you lose the game. I think you, if, if you have to run through the same matchup again, you 
I think you have the same it. game plan. You at least have a similar one. Maybe you have a little bit of a wrinkle. Try to add one extra look of some kind. He only threw four changeups. Uh, I don't think his changeups that good, but like, you know, maybe a little bit element of surprise there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you show that early just to plant that seed of doubt in the minds of the opposing lineup, and then maybe even use it less than you would make them think you're going to use it? But it just it just makes them a little less comfortable. That would be interesting to see like three change up in the first inning and he threw four the entire last game, right? Mm-hmm. And you're yeah. like, ooh, what's he doing with that change up? Yeah. Well, you were talking about this. You know how you kind of have to at this point in time have some trick up your sleeve, right? Because they've seen him a lot. As we mentioned, not a lot of hard hits, but still a lot of contact. That still, I would think, gives the Astros some kind of optimism going into this game, right? They're at home. I don't know. Have we seen is the roof going to be closed or not? Um, it's just a tough place to play. It's a place the Astros have historically played very well. So I would think you're looking for any kind of edge, any kind of way to put the Astros back on their heels a little bit, especially early, because you want to take the crowd out of it as the visiting team. What was Roofgate all about? I, I feel like uh, there was like pushback from local fans and uh, like the Astros, like, you know, not wanting to have the roof open. Was it just because yeah. air conditioning is nice or... Fans apparently complain whenever the roof is open because of the sun and the conditions. Um, mm. Also, it's a much, it, you know, it's a much it plays like Tropicana Field, right? Like a straight park. You don't worry about the weather conditions mm. or anything like that. But um, apparently it is a big deal and fans and the Astros players would prefer, prefer. to have it closed. I yeah. bet you it's louder, too. Yeah, that's the other thing. The noise just reverberates, right? Yeah. So um that is another factor as well so yeah it was it was unusual when it was open for what game was it two yeah it was two two, it was two um so does that change things because it certainly changed you know we've seen with the cold air a lot these fly balls not carry right we've seen we've seen the impact of the weather and now we're in november and so i'm curious to see what they do tonight i don't know if i've seen a tweet about what they're going to do with the roof, but I didn't realize either until the first series I was down in Houston. And I was like, Oh no, no. The people were like, the fans hate it. The players hate it. Got to have mm-hmm. the roof closed. Just I imagine it's a little bit like, you know, I think the, some of the loudest places I've ever been or been basketball uh, stadiums, which are closed, you know, and they don't even have as many fans as a baseball uh, stadium, but they can be even louder. I think there's even a study that said that like Utah, <laughs> like the loudest stadium <laughs> like the really? loudest yeah uh it's not called stadium what's it called arena arena there we go thank you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my german showed for a second no i just feel like it's uh me auditioning for Se- uh, sesame street is what it really is oh by the way one little tiny crossover thing from the world of basketball there's a ball crisis in basketball i love it oh there no. is you yeah you they switched this? They, I don't know, Wilson either they either switched to Wilson or Wilson switched the ball. I need to to learn more about this, but they're all talking about it in the basketball Slack channel. It's funny that um, I'm the like most sucker. Sport in the world <laughs> changes the ball constantly, and I never hear anyone complaining about it. Like it not not who does football soccer? Yeah, they change it. All oh, the time. soccer does constantly. The ball changes every year. It's like a marketing thing to sell new balls. Yeah, but is that less important because you're not touching it? No, it definitely still matters because the way you can spin the ball, like more panels, fewer panels, the way the panels are constructed, like it, mm. at that level especially, it oh, definitely you, matters. The, so the it probably kickers. is a huge deal. Yeah, the Beckhams of the world are like, Grr! you got to figure out how to spin this one again. Yeah, uh, we are not a soccer show, are we? <laughs> or a basketball <laughs> show. <laughs> this, is, this is deep, though. Uh. Real, real deep. Uh, I, I, don't like, I don't like going to games with the roof closed in general. Like Miller Park, obviously, the roof's closed more than it probably should because be. Because for... baseball feels like an outdoor sport? Yeah, well, yeah, it kind of feels like you're in the Mall of America when you're in a, a baseball stadium with the roof shut. Like, you're in the, the middle part of that place, which is a, a strange vibe. But the thing I don't like about it, if it's closed on a warm, humid day, there's just no airflow in a stadium mm. with a ceiling on it, essentially. And it just feels gross, so... Houston, especially, where the humidity and the heat are a lot worse than they are even in Milwaukee, uh, it just feels like a really uncomfortable, sweaty place to be. So I have I have no interest in in that. Now I realize, like, yeah, Chase Field on a July day, yeah, the roof has to be closed because 110 degrees 
in the bleachers. It's funny, would Sam Chess is pointing out that it's pretty, and I'm like, I don't. How often is that that roof open? Same thing in Toronto. It's really pretty. I think when they have it open, and it's not open that often. I feel mm. like, um, but. I do think that all stadiums that are new should be built with a retractable option. It's 2021. We waste a ton of money on rain delays. Uh, guys get hurt when they're playing in these field conditions, right? Like, so you're, to me, the, the whole double headers really is just not great baseball. I think every new stadium needs a retractable also, option. With climate change as the elephant in the room, uh, I think you might want to put a retractable roof on there because yeah. you don't know what, how many more, you know, how, how the temperature will go up or how much rain or how much rain you won't get. And it just makes it easier to control the conditions. Yeah. Yes. And like, we're into November now. What if the twins were in, what if the tigers were in, right? Like we're talking about places that like in November, it's borderline winter. Um, so I just, I think that you probably need to consider that. Among I was really surprised the twins, consider. the twins built a stadium with no roof. Me too. Um, for that reason. In April, it's winter is still there. Mm -hmm. um, like I went to school in Michigan. There'd be piles of snow in May when you're walking to your final exams that hadn't melted because it wasn't warm enough yet. So Derek knows. Derek knows. He knows this life. Um, April is not springtime. It's an extension of winter. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I do think that they all should have some kind of option for that. But luckily, they got Houston and Atlanta. But let me tell you guys, Atlanta over the weekend when I was down there was like the nor'easter. It was basically winter there. It was cold. It was rainy. Um, I do think that affected a little bit of, of what you saw offensively, certainly um, on Friday, Saturday there. Uh, it was just, it, it's fascinating how much, especially at this, when these games are so important, how much um, the weather could maybe have an impact. And Dusty Baker spoke about it a lot. Like his infielders didn't have a chance to see how the grass played at the field and um, little things like that. Uh, that you don't think of end up having huge impacts on these games. <laughs> what uh, what a uh, uh, a ridiculous thing about baseball, though, that we play from February to November now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's just uh, and, and, like you just you're just begging for for weather to have a huge impact. You know, what if there was uh, uh, you know, like we're going to get into like hurricane season and yeah, not great. Uh, as far as tonight's game goes, <laughs> predictions Derek puts us back on the track. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I was monitoring some uh, some notorious, uh, some nefarious bot work in the live chat. So I think I've I think I've silenced it. Hopefully, we'll we'll find out if there are more bots to come. But uh, predictions for Game Six. What do you think, Britt? Um, I think the Astros are going to win. I think we're going to see a seven. I've always thought that this was going to go seven. The second the Astros, the Braves' real chance was that five in Atlanta. And the second that went the Astros, way, they kept that door open. And I do think we may have a potential 2016 Chicago Cubs situation on our hands. Um, I think the Astros are going to win this series. And I think, obviously, that means they have to win tonight. So I'm going to go with the Astros. I think that that, that group of hitters is going to start mashing tonight at home, no matter what the roof is doing. Um I just think this team is going to be able to come back. Well, you'd have to think that these Astros hitters at home and getting a second look at Freed, who, you know, we've already sort of pointed out, doesn't match up super well with their strengths. Um, they, they know like if Freed does that same book again, I'd, I'd actually, I know I said earlier, Oh, he got some soft contact and he did. Okay. I think if he does the same book again, they were going to anticipate it better. So in the first, if they start, if he starts filling up the zone with breaking balls, they're like, okay, he's just doing what he did last time. Here we go. And we're going to see a string of singles. So I could actually see neither starting pitcher getting out of the third. And if that's the case, I'm taking the Astros. So, yeah, I do think there's a, a very good chance. Um, we're not going to see Garcia long because of the conditions we talked about earlier. I think with Freed, it comes back to that element of surprise, be that the early changeup or something else. If we see a wrinkle, I'm a lot more encouraged about Atlanta's chances of him getting maybe five innings and, and taking a little bit of, of wear and tear off the bullpen. Have you seen anything about Minter's availability? I have to wonder if they'd even push him out there, if they're trying to save him for a possible game seven. I mean, I think he's probably available, but do they actually want to use him 
after how things played out on Sunday. Yeah. The problem now to me with, with Atlanta doing these back-to-back bullpen games, and I know they had to, is that if you don't get a deep start from Freed, you've got a third bullpen game, essentially. And as we saw with Minter, we saw Houston get to him. Now, how do you feel about Will Smith? How do you feel about Matzik? And actually, Sam Chess Music and I, who who uh, commented in the chat, have kind of the same thinking. It's how many times are you going to see these relievers? Eventually, something's got to give, right? And Atlanta's bullpen has been terrific. Brian Snicker joked that after the season's over, the ownership should send them to Hawaii, right? Like they've just above and beyond performed. However, we know how good the Houston's offense is. Are they going to continue to be shut down by these same arms once they've seen them for the third, fourth time in a short span? I don't think so. I believe that Brandon Morrow pitched in every World Series game for the Dodgers. And the last time he pitched, he gave up like a big homer. And then we never really saw him again, did we? I think, like it's awful. Yeah, that's an awful story, and I, I hate to tell it, but it it's a true one. Um, and I I wonder how you balance that with like, no, we haven't seen Minter in every game, but we have seen him for like three innings. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and somebody's saying that uh, someone's going to go off yard off Smith eventually. I mean, I think, uh, I think that um, it might just be walks. You know. It's easier to take pitches uh, that are borderline the more you see a guy, too. And Smith has been – that's been really what's gotten Smith in trouble in the past. I think I danced around an actual prediction. I think I'm feeling more like a 5-4 sort of game favoring Houston. I think they do extend it to 7. I've sort of felt like they're inevitably going to win this World Series for a while, uh, despite – maybe some of waffling predictions along the way where I wanted other teams to win. So I snuck them in instead, but uh, <laughs> this, this just seems like the, the world series outcome that, that baseball deserves in, in some ways. And uh, there, I think there are diminishing returns when you rely as heavily on the bullpen as Atlanta has, hopefully for their sake, they come in rested and they've got a chance to close it out tonight. I, I feel like if it goes seven, even though the odds won't be that far in favor of Houston I feel like it stacks up so much more against Atlanta if they don't get it done tonight like the pressure just continues to build as a team that has had these these postseason demons in the past and having lost a 3-1 lead in the NLCS last year as more things start to unravel it, I think it weighs more on you as you're trying to, to stop it yeah it was Let's... a dynasty <laughs> I'm not disputing that. <laughs> uh, haven't all three of you picked season against... demons? Uh, it was a absolutely, dynasty. Absolutely not, Jonathan. I picked the Braves in the first two series. I picked them to beat the Brewers, and I also picked them to beat the Dodgers. So, well, I can't speak for these two. Britt once again that. saving our cookies. Yes, <laughs> I, I can I, say I... <laughs> um, that I thought the Braves were good. I was. I took offense to the Dodgers losing that series. I thought the Braves won it, but I think you two. Did you two pick against them the first two series? Or did someone have Milwaukee oh, lose? Yeah, I definitely picked the Brewers and the Dodgers and Houston. I mean, I and, picked I picked the uh, Astros Brewers as the World Series. So And I had I mean, Houston in six in this series, which going is, into the postseason, I had I had the, the best teams in baseball I thought were the Astros, Dodgers, and Brewers. Now the Brewers had a very obvious Achilles heel and it came up to bite them, and maybe I should have listened to the inner voice that told me they can't hit. I, but. you know, I, I kind of put a thread out there on Twitter. I don't tweet very often, but um, I did. I did put it out there. I and I've been making game picks uh, for the betting side, and I've definitely picked the Braves a, a few times. But uh, <sighs> nope, I picked against them in the series. I mean, it's not like there's like you, that makes it sound like you picked against them in every series. What? Well, um, Yes, three, three, <laughs> and we did. We did all pick, as Sam just points out, we did all pick Houston to win this series. I picked at the Astros along with you, Eno, to to win the World Series. So, 
couldn't really pick against myself. I won't be mad. They got be accused of bias or whatever, like, you know, or, you know, now we're getting these ulterior motives, like, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to make me look less pathetic. Whatever those ulterior motives. I mean, I, I think we're just trying to figure out who we think are the better teams and, and bet on those. That doesn't always, you know, the best team doesn't always win. And I wouldn't be mad. I mean, I, I used to go to Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, get waved down in the second inning. Uh, in 1988, when there was nobody at the park, like I, I love the Braves. Uh, you know, that was the first team I ever, I ever followed. So, uh, I think I'd be very happy for a lot of people in Atlanta. Yeah. Still have I a agree. lot of friends and family there. It's, it's, it would be I, good for them. I think the Braves are the better story, and they're the easier team to root for. I just think that Houston has this extra chip to prove that they're good, right? Because their only championship recently as of late has now been tainted by the scandal of cheating so i think this group of astros which after this year may be even smaller right they're probably going to lose correa uh, you know which is a, a big a big vocal part of this team um i think this you look at this group of astros and what is their legacy if they don't win this world series uh, it's hard to say because I, I still think even if they lose pieces from the core, the way this team is built and, and how they do what they do is still, even with the changes on the roster, it's still pretty similar to what we saw three and four years ago. It's still they do damage, don't strike out a lot, and develop pitching. I mean, like part of the pitching a few years ago was a little more star heavy, but I don't know. I'm almost more impressed by what they're doing at this stage than what they were doing at the very beginning of it. When you see how, how these pieces have all kind of played out and I mean, Atlanta has been an underdog in every series so far. So picking against them wasn't completely ridiculous. It was just eating a lot of chalk along the way. So no, I think uh, the legacy of the Astros is a, is a complicated one. I mean, I, I, they've won a lot of games in, in, in seasons that weren't the one that they got in trouble for. You know, there's uh, a lot of uh, other teams that were doing similar things that got in trouble. Two, two, two teams and got in trouble just like the Astros. It just it didn't involve a trash can, and it didn't involve another player pointing the finger. I think that's partially uh, parts of why it, it didn't blow up as big. Um, I, it's a complicated legacy, but if they if they don't win this one. It's almost like the Braves, but their one win the Braves of the '90s, but their win win is an asterisk. <laughs> You know, which is yes. uh, which is a tough one. I don't know that I I don't think that there's like a lot of comparisons. Um, you know, I mean, the Red Sox got in trouble, but were we clear that they got in trouble for stuff they were doing in the year that they won? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I, I think the other thing too, it's it's so hard to have repeated success. Like dynasties are are very difficult to pull off in today's game. There's so many different ways to, to build a roster and to try and, and win in this format. And I think even the Dodgers, like you did similar questions about the Dodgers and, and what they've done over the last five years. They have one World Series to show for it. I still, it doesn't bother me that it came last season because even if there were 162 games last season, they were a virtual lock to be in the postseason. And then the postseason was longer because of the format last year. So it wasn't it wasn't like the road was that much easier, at least as far as how the playoffs work. It was actually a little bit more difficult. So I think Houston's still in that same sort of, of, of boat. If they end up getting knocked out, if Atlanta wins, it's well-deserved because they've played so well throughout the postseason. But I don't think it I don't think it closes the window on the Astros current wind like their current build which i still think is open for another couple of years even though we're going to have more turnover on that roster this off season all yeah, right I, I think no go yeah. ahead you know no what are you gonna say i i think this group is still going to be good i agree with you they've got the kyle tuckers and uh you know Jordan alvarez but i this current group that we associate with cheating is getting dispersed every year so this seems like the end of that to some extent and so what will the legacy of that core group be if they lose this World Series? I don't know. And, and somebody brought up the good point of what would have happened with McCullers and Morton. I think this would have been a totally different series. I think this would have been a more fun series to watch from a pure baseball perspective because you can rely on those guys to start. Uh, certainly for the Braves, I think I, you'd feel a lot better in six and seven knowing that you had Morton because you could piggyback Freed or Ian Anderson, right? You could, you could really win the pitching 
if you had Charlie Morton, if you're the Braves. And listen. But McCullers I, doesn't get shelled like Fromber, probably. Um, no. You know, McCullers changes that side. You know, I think this comes up a lot. I've seen this a lot more, this discourse a lot more in basketball where people are like, um, you know, look at each finals and they should each have an asterisk because, you know, Westbrook was hurt this year and this guy was hurt that year and this guy was hurt that year. I mean, I... I get it. And it does. It's meaningful. And injury is the biggest source of chaos. I think one of maybe the biggest source of chaos in terms of what happens with the team versus their projections. At the same time, uh, like you can't you can't go back and change things and injuries happen to everyone. And, and like in this case, it happened to both sides. So I don't know that it, it necessarily changed uh, this series that much. I mean, it would have changed like how each game might have gone, but I, they, they both lost a really good pitcher. Yeah, that, that's that's just sports. That's just the grind of professional sports. I mean, uh, football, the teams that win the Super Bowl every year. Oh, yeah, part of it's that they weren't as injured as other teams or the players they lost maybe weren't as important as the players that stayed healthy, but it's just part of the game. It's part of the, the war of attrition. It's part of how it works over a 26-week season that then runs you know, another five weeks into the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Now, my main issue with the Dodgers 60 game season last year, Derek, is that the Padres would have would have been a playoff team this year if they only played 60 games. Just just to give you an idea of how crazy the 60 game season is in baseball. And yeah. that that leads to lead even more to the segue I was going to make, which is segue noise. Uh, one of the things that's really <laughs> uh, exciting about getting Bob Melvin, I think, in San Diego um, is that he's such a great 162 game manager. Um, the one sort of the biggest asset that I would say that Bob Melvin has, and this is from talking to players like, you know, he's a great communicator. So you always know where you stand and you always know that you're valued. And that even if you've become a short side platoon guy or the fourth, like the utility guy, the fourth infielder, even if, you know, you're, you've played your way into, you know, a lesser role, he's, he, he keeps telling you, we're going to need you. We're going to need you. You need, you're going to need to step up, keep, keep doing the grind. You know, we're going to use you on Thursday and we're going to use you on Saturday. And, you know, you can play your way back into this. Um, and you know, this is a long season. So that's, that's sort of the mantra that he gives, uh, that he gives to the players that no matter where you are in, in your career and no matter where you are necessarily on the depth chart, uh, you know, you're a valued member of the organization. You're going to have to step up. Um, I, I don't know how much that's worth and like wins above replacement. Um, and I don't know that we could ever know that sort of thing, but it does, I think, lead to sometimes role players on the A's um, so, sort of playing over their skis, you know, and, 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 and doing a little bit more than you might expect. And that's that's sort of I think that, that that's something that that the uh, that the Padres could have used last year when they when they fell apart down the stretch. Yeah, some some great comments uh, in the stream that the A's fire sale should be fun on the flip side. Yes, um, it's going to be a rough <laughs> few years to uh, to be an A's fan. Somebody mentioned that Jace Tingler talking about the the 60 game uh, season, which is what I just mentioned. And I, I do think. I do really like the trend now of getting back towards more experienced managers, not because younger guys can't do it, but I think when you look at what the manager role is now, it has become a, a primarily a manager of people, right? Of staying calm, of managing personalities. Uh, we know that they have various degrees of input on things like the lineup and the bullpen. We know that they make a good chunk of the in-game decisions, but really they manage people and they put out clubhouse fires. And manage and media. And they manage the media. They talk to the media nonstop. And they are the front-facing public face of an organization. Um, and so I think when you look at it that way, guys like Bob Melvin should be in demand, should be in the game. And every player I've ever covered who has had Bob Melvin loves him. You can't find anyone that says a bad word about Bob Melvin. And I think it's kind of important to note, like, is he the most analytical of managers? No. Is he a great manager of people on an with an organization that already has an analytic staff and he will be privy to all those numbers. Yes. And I think that's the way we need to look at these things a little bit more is the, the, because these departments have these um, analytics departments and they have these numbers guys, and they have so much input from the GM already. All you need is a manager who's going to listen and want to work well with them, right? They don't need to be 
the the nerdy numbers geek in the, in the dugout. There's enough of those people. They're sometimes in the dugouts on the staff anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the important thing is for Bob Melvin is to be able to handle a Fernando Tatis, Manny Machado fight in the dugout, right? To be able to tell the media, you know what? These guys should be speaking to you and explain what went on rather than what the Padres let happen, which is three days of nothing and everyone's speculating. Bob Melvin understands how to put out fires how to deal yeah. with personalities and how to keep clubhouse stuff in the clubhouse. And I think in 2021, that is like the most important job of a manager. He, he protects his players, you know, he, even when he's criticizing them, he's, uh, he's really good at doing it in a certain way. Um, you know, he's just, uh, he, he, I think the players always feel that Bob Melvin has their back and you just look at some of the players uh, current and past uh, that have played under him that have uh, that have gone to bat for him. Um, and they're as varied as Josh Donaldson and Chris Bassett, you know, who are very different personalities. Um, and he's uh, he's stepped up for them. I do think it was surprising. There was no compensation uh, for Melvin. Um, I think probably uh, uh, I mean, the Padres just said, like, we're not going to give you anything and then i think the a's had a choice of like keeping uh him melvin back from an opportunity he wanted and they just said well it seems like you want this and yeah and we're not going to pay you as much as the padres are offering so you know yeah that would go, make go take me pretty job. upset if that's a, a significant difference at all and i would assume that it, it probably was yeah, but I do think also uh, Ruben Niebla, uh, the that hiring could be, could be really huge. I think that he was, I don't think he was the architect for the whole Cleveland pitching development system, but uh, he grew up in it. He would, you know, when I talk to people about it, they, they say he was a really, really huge key component of it. Um, and, uh, you know, when I just talked to Cal Quantrill about like how they developed his cutter this year, it wasn't just Niebla, but Niebla knows that's how it works where the bullpen catcher is talking to the assistant pitching coach is talking to the pitching coach everybody knows what's going on they're on the same page and they're not breathing down their pitcher's throat so you know if you're Mackenzie gore you know everyone knows what's going on but they're not telling you eight million different things and trying to do you know make you do eight million different things so i think niebla understands that like you know the best coaches don't need to tell you everything they know they, they know everything and uh, they're calm and they try to connect with you and they try to just let you know that they're there to make you better and, and kind of take things at a slow pace, not just, you know, breathe down your throat and this is everything I know. So yeah. I think Nia was a, a really, really good coach. And I think this is a really good hire. So Zach Meisel's got a piece about uh, Ruben Nabla because he was in Cleveland previously. And it seems like every pitcher in that staff talked about Niebla and had had something they really liked about him. Uh, Cal Quantrill summed it up at the end of the piece. Ruben is fantastic at taking data and putting it into a digestible format. Can you take information and make it palatable to someone else? That is how good of a coach you are. I mean, that's that's kind of part of what a manager has to do, too, is take, take the analytics, take that information, and then just make everyone believe in it and convey it to people. Like, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it ask a few questions like, Hey, you have your style, you have your feel that, that works for people, especially a pitching coach. I mean, that's huge. Clearly they underperformed as a staff, the Padres in, in 2021. So there's plenty of reason to be optimistic because if you go back to this time last year, or I guess closer to the winter meetings as they rebuilt this rotation, I think we liked it. I think we all said, this is great. They're going all in. They're getting everyone. They got Darvish. They got Musgrove. They get Snell. They're going to have Clevenger coming back from injury. This is a group that has what seems like a, a very bright future for the most part. Plus, you add in Mackenzie Gore, who's pitching in the Fall League right now. How much more do you like this group of pitchers as bounce-back candidates for the most part? I mean, Musgrove obviously had a good year, but do you see a lot of reasons for optimism on the heels of this hire? Is this one way to fix your flaws without going out and getting four more pitchers? Because that didn't really seem realistic <laughs> For the Padres to keep adding to that stable of arms. Yeah, I mean, if if the pipeline is broken, you have to look at it. And after the Padres collapse, you have to kind of look internally and say, what did we do wrong, right? Because they spent money. They had a roster that had people announcing them as World Series champions in February or March, right? So 
I think what they've done is the right thing in getting some fresh faces in there. And I think people make the mistake of saying, well, all the coaches who are out were the problem. And, that, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, I think a lot of times um, having a first time manager presents a lot of unique challenges. So I think having Bob Melvin, he's not going to sit there and be threatened by the pitching coach, right? That's not Bob Melvin. Whereas when you're a first time manager, I think it just lends to a lot of uncertainty among a coaching staff that isn't necessarily your guys. So I think what they did in San Diego with, you know, putting some pieces around a veteran guy like Bob Melvin, they're all going to work cohesively. There's not going to be issues. And that's going to translate into just a better, smoother run operation. And somebody mentioned in the comments, like, if you could fix Gore, that that in and of itself makes San Diego a much better team. Um, so I think you have to be optimistic if you're San Diego. Um, and I, I like the speed in which they got it done. I mean, you're seeing an unprecedented amount. I was talking to a, a team president last night and I said, you know, every year we see these turnover around this time of year, but it is double, I think, what I've ever seen. And he said, you know, last year people were waiting because of COVID. There were all these freezes. So what you're seeing now is a lot of musical chairs and a lot of clubs moving quickly because they know if they don't get their people, they're going to be left on the outside looking in. And then, of course, we have the Mets who haven't even filled their highest ranking job and are really going to be stuck with the leftovers, like the, you know, the stuff that the buzzards left out because they haven't really made any moves. But I like that, you know, the Padres have made some quick moves here. You're going to see, you know, you saw the Cubs go after their GM role and filling that immediately. Cleveland is going to have to fill these holes quickly. They've lost a lot of really good people. I think they're really going to um, kind of push to get that done before the GM meeting. So it's fascinating to see all these clubs kind of reload here because last winter, no one was sure what was going on. We're now seeing like an unprecedented amount of turnover in the game. And I'm, I don't know, it's going to be interesting. I'm hoping that that's a good sign for labor peace. Um, you know, they, they people are acting like there'll be baseball soon. Uh, I do think it's interesting to think about what the Padres did versus what the Mets have done. I feel like the Mets leaked a, a, a long list of superstar names because they wanted to be like, yeah, we're a superstar team and like the best are going to come to us. And then they went down that list and all of them said no. And now it looks terrible because they're going to have to pick someone that's not on that list that they leaked. You know, <laughs> like, It's like, no, we're still interested in some really cool people. You just never heard of them. Um, <laughs> and uh, the last thing I want to say about the Padres thing is I, I do think that I really hope that Niebla um, uh, gets more than like one year. Uh, and that this is like sort of a, a systemic uh, approach because I do think that the Weathers and Paddock and Gord are like three pitchers that um, could benefit really quickly from from a change in coaching. But also you're hoping that this is more of a long term thing that he helps the next David Weathers uh, pop up in the right way. So, um, you know, I, I hope that they give him more time than one just one year because. He could come in and be a great coach and Paddock just gets hurt and Weathers does, you know, needs another year before that really pops. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. things take time. Um, yeah. And then the last thing, does Dave Cameron leaving hurt them? Yes, I do uh, very much yeah. think so. Uh, he was a uh, an advocate for analytics within the organization. Uh, they're going to need to identify somebody that can voice uh, the, the the analytics side and, and do so in a very strong, strong manner, do, you know, basically be the advocate for the analytics um because uh there's a, frankly it's a it's a team that skews scouting so they they need yeah. someone uh with a strong voice on the analytics side man so many good off-season comments here for when baseball is over but i do think uh donnie ecker um from the giants taking the offensive coordinator job with the rangers is a big loss so we're, doing the giants for, we're just changing yeah, that we're gonna, we're gonna call them offensive love, coordinators now I, I, I love it also like oh what, what are you now oh i'm the offensive coordinator for the texas rangers like what wrong sport um you knew the giants were gonna lose some people right you knew they were gonna lose some coaches um i like that teams are maybe placing more of an emphasis on coaches because of the whole copycat shtick right the giants got a lot of coaches placed a lot of emphasis there and they had a lot of success on marginal players, on it improving in the margins. And uh, not marginal players, that sounds bad. Improving in the margins sounds better. Um, these are big leaguers. We can't do what they can do. Brandon Crawford, uh, marginal player. Marginal player. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, but um, I think it's 
it's interesting. Again, teams like the Rangers hurrying up, filling roles. Mets, I know you say you're not, you're not in a rush. You should be in a rush. Yeah, the Rangers you. didn't just hire Donnie Ecker. Uh, they also hired uh, Josh Bonifay. Uh, didn't Brian Bannister go somewhere today too? Or Jeff Bannister? Sorry, oh, Jeff really? Bannister. Who's Brian Bannister? Brian Bannister is the director of pitching in uh, San Francisco. Okay. He, Jeff Bannister, he, he longtime manager. He Where is he now? Uh, somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Jonathan is asking about Freed. I, I think that uh, we've talked about this a few times um, on, on the show, but I think that we just think that uh, he's running up against a team that uh, matches up really, uh, really strongly against him. He, he loves to throw the high and tight fastball to righties to keep them honest and uh uh that's uh, that's korea altuve and bregman love the high and tight fastball so he's now on his second he's like on his b approach and that that's what you're seeing you're seeing his his second best uh approach the diamondbacks bench coach Bannister. diamondback against yes, diamondbacks bench coach well the diamondbacks okay. i i think uh are sneaky uh in need of i mean they i think they let go a lot of their coaches so, yeah. Like I said, I there's just been un- unprecedented turnover this year. Um, yeah. Well, it's that time of year. But, I mean, why wait? Like, if you, if you have a coach you're interested in, if you don't go get that person, someone else will. It's it's always one of the fastest things we see. But it does seem like that is sped up quite a bit in recent years. Uh, Daniel in the live stream, Dave Cameron is the Mets GM would be a great story and a great under the radar hire. Do you understand the size of the banner that the nerds will drop that day? <laughs> like we're gonna we're gonna have to get a new machine to make a bigger banner if that happens. I have to say I'll be I'll be surprised. My uh, understanding from talking to him is um, that uh, the the always on nature of baseball was uh, grinding on him a little bit. His kids are are young and um, can't even you can't even really go to the beach. You can't really go. You can't go camping. You know, you can't go off grid. Uh, there's a there's a there's a work life balance problem within baseball. I mean, it's, it's just honestly, you know, that's a big part of why I've never I've never really tried to advance talks with any teams. Doesn't seem great. But uh, on that note. We are going to go as we uh, mentioned. Uh, we're oh, Luna for Mets DM though. I, I could totally see that. I mean, at this point, just keep going. Yeah, oh gosh, he'd probably be no. the best name that hasn't said no yet. Might be one of the few people that would yeah. say yes because he might not get the opportunity anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely not. Take us out, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a topic uh, for a future future day. But uh, as always, you can get a subscription to The Athletic, 33% off for the first year at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. We are back here tomorrow regardless because even if Atlanta wins the World Series tonight, we'll be here to recap it on Wednesday morning. So at least one more show. Root for the series to go seven if you want more shows than that at least of the playoff nature. Of course, 11.30 a.m. Eastern is the start time on Twitter. Eno is at Eno Saris. Britt is at Britt underscore Giroli. I am at Derek Van Riper. And yes, the pod itself has an account at Rates and Barrels. It doesn't tweet yet, but someday it might. Be sure to barrel up on the like button if you're watching us on YouTube. That is going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Wednesday. Thanks for listening.